I'm Dwayne Brown. Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, troubling new numbers on methamphetamine use in San Diego County. And the Pentagon is taking some heat over a fitness test. Doctors say it's driving some service members to liposuction. I'm Peggy Pico. San Diego Interim Mayor Todd Gloria talks with us about a bond to help repair streets, improve emergency response times, and other major projects the City Council is tackling. And human genome pioneer Craig Venter talks to us about his book, Life at the Speed of Light, From the Double Helix to the Dawn of Digital Life, how he plans to invent a new type of bacteria and vaccines. And good news for a South Bay Nature Center. Donors came to their financial rescue, but now they have to plan for the future. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. Hi, good evening. Thanks for joining us. There's a reprieve tonight for folks who've had trouble signing up for insurance under the Affordable Care Act. The Obama administration is granting a six-week extension for people to sign up and avoid tax penalties. You now have until March 31st. This was expected because of technical problems with healthcare.gov, the federal website. California's own site faced a few challenges of its own. Coming up later on Evening Edition, we'll be answering more of your questions about the Affordable Care Act. A new report says methamphetamine use is rebounding in San Diego County at its highest level in seven years. The Sandag report says police are finding more suspects testing positive for meth, and the number of people dying from meth use jumped by 16 percent in just one year. The number of emergency room visits also went up. Governor Jerry Brown will not be challenging a parole board's decision to release a former San Diego woman from prison. Sarah Cruzan grew up here for a time and faced life in prison for killing her abusive pimp. She was 17 at the time. Cruzan was eligible for parole. Following a deal her lawyers made with prosecutors, she will be released this week into transitional housing, where she will also receive counseling and job training. Her lawyers say she is excited about the future. Prosecutors began presenting their case earlier today in the retrial of Richard Tewitt, the man accused of killing 12-year-old Stephanie Crow in Escondido in 1998. Stephanie's mother was the first witness today. Tewitt was convicted of murder nearly 10 years ago, but a federal court overturned the conviction last year and ordered a new trial. San Diego City Council unanimously approved a plan to reorganize the management structure of the mayor's office. Interim Mayor Todd Gloria calls the plan a series of strategic common sense tweaks to make the government run more smoothly. It calls for the creation of three new executive uh, management positions, new departments, annual leadership academies, and the hiring of a national expert to study city operations. The changes are expected to cost about $1 million a year. Well, as the city moves closer to the mayoral special election, city council is trying to tackle more of the practical issues like street repairs. Peggy Pico has this update. From a major infrastructure bond to emergency response times and the La Jolla Children's Pool. So those are just a few things among others San Diego's interim mayor and the city council are moving forward on in major projects. Joining me with further details is Interim Mayor Todd Gloria. Welcome back. Thanks, Peggy. So um, the backlog of infrastructures, let's start here. The repairs is estimated at uh, $900 million or more. Mm -hmm. You've proposed a $120 million uh, infrastructure bond. How is that gap going to be uh, made up? Well, time will tell. You know, the $120 million dollar bond offering is a reflection of what we can afford financially as a city at this moment in time and what we can realistically get done. I mean, if we had a billion dollars tomorrow, we couldn't deploy enough projects with the staff that we have. Um, so this is what, why we went with that size of a bond offering. Uh, we're continuing to work on a five-year plan to sort of anticipate our needs and what we can afford and, and, and whatnot, and that will come before the council in the next few months. And where would that extra gap money come from? Well, some of that will be additional bond capacity backed by the city's general fund, um, but ultimately there's going to be a gap there, and what we're going to have to do is go to the voters and ask them uh, what they'd like to see. It may be that you don't want anything else done and you're okay, um, or maybe you want to do something bigger, um, but ultimately that's a question I think the voters will have to anticipate. How is the city council going to decide what 
what gets fixed first? Well, we are trying to do that in a more objective manner where we do actual annual uh, condition indexes. That's something that really wasn't done before and that helps us to, in an objective way, decide which road is really the worst and should get attention. Uh, we're also soliciting public input now in a way that we really haven't before. So those things combined also with professional input. You know, we have some areas where fire uh, uh, capabilities are not what they need to be, like in Skyline or on Home Avenue. And so you'll see money in the bond to try and address that as well. So it's all those things coming together in a comprehensive strategy. Um, before we get on to the emergency services, um, there's a meeting Wednesday night. Tell us a little about that, right? Is that correct for the uh, bond issues and infrastructure correct. For sh issues? Well, uh, also part of this comprehensive effort, again, is getting more public input. There are workshops being held in every council district. The next one is in Council District 4 on Wednesday. And I'd encourage any San Diegan to go and give their input. Let's revisit that uh, emergency response, especially in some of the uh, city's poorest neighborhoods. Yes. There's been a lot of concern over emergency response delays. How much of this money will be used to address that? Do we know yet? Uh, well, it, the the proposal I put forward includes uh, funding uh, for both a, a fire station in Skyline area and one on Home Avenue. Both of these were identified uh, through the CityGate report that we commissioned a number of years ago as being sort of our, our, our worst response time areas. Um, there's been, obviously, as you mentioned, a lot of public uh, discussion of this, a lot of good journalism around it, and that's reflected in this offering. We hear you. Uh, we're listening. I'm paying attention, and that's why I put it in the bond. Let's talk about the city charter. Uh, city Hall is trying to overhaul that, I understand, or at mm -hmm. least make some changes to it. Um, how, what is that process like and what are some of the highlights as far as uh, what needs to be changed in that in your opinion? Well, you have seen both our city attorney and our council president pro tem, Sherry Leitner, both say, you know, time has come for us to uh, amend our charter. We have a number of issues unrelated to the recall process and some of the things that we saw around the previous mayor, uh, other things uh, involving lots of different stuff. That process really is going to kick off in earnest, I think, early next year. Uh, it'll involve a citizens committee uh, that will go out and spend time really studying the issue, developing a series of recommendations to put to the voters. My guess is that's probably a question you'll see on your ballot sometime in 2016. And uh, I think we have enough time to tackle this. Uh, tomorrow the City Council is going to be asked to declare the La Jolla Children's Pool a habitat during mm -hmm. a harbor or seal birthing season. Uh, would you like to see that happen? I personally would. I, I have been a longtime supporter of the SEALs in La Jolla. I think tomorrow's action, if approved, will allow us to really provide that space uh, during pupping season and help maintain this amazing attraction that it, you know, brings in millions of visitors uh, and who really enjoy that opportunity. And I, I think the council should vote to uh, support that. Well, I know there's so much more to talk about that we don't have time to. So there's a lot more on our website, and I'm sure they can uh, contact you as well. San Diego Interim Mayor Todd Gloria, thanks very much. Thanks, Peggy. More than 2,000 inmates are being transferred from California prisons to private facilities out of state. It's part of a court order to reduce overcrowding at a cost of $60 per inmate per day. The transfers are expected to be complete in about a month. Once they're done, the state still has to cut about 6,000 more inmates. The federal government's giving more than $22 million in grant money to uh, San Diego's Lindbergh Field. The county's regional airport authority says the grants will allow the airport to continue with its sustainability initiatives. The money will be used to continue the airport's sound insulation program, reduce ground emissions, and improve airfield drainage systems. An outpouring of community support has given new life to a longtime nature center in Chula Vista. Living Coast Discovery Center was in danger of closing this month if it didn't raise $200,000. The nonprofit zoo and aquarium has been educating folks about local wildlife for 26 years. What do you like best? The jellyfish. What do you like about them? Because they do that. Oh, they go up and down in the water and float. Four-year-old Pearl is a big fan of jellyfish, and she also loves the smiling bat rays found in our local waters. Pearl and her mom have been coming to the Living Coast Discovery Center since she was a baby, where indigenous birds, snakes, sharks, and colorful fish are on display. It's quiet, simple, and exposes the kids to things they might not other, otherwise learn about. L.J. Livingston says she responded to the center's SOS to save our sea life by doing her part to raise the $200,000 to keep the center open. We did everything we could to spread the word. I was on Facebook every day, and we created some fundraisers. We raised four hundred dollars More than $400,000. That's double the amount needed to operate another year with a reserve fund so they can develop a new business plan, says 
Ben Vallejos. The community saw the business people wanted to support the center, the school districts wanted to support the center, and then the money came rolling in. So families, kids, and visitors can keep coming to learn about critters who live in our own backyard. The center has already collected more than $250,000 in donations. The rest is expected to come in over the next month or so. Some medical experts want the Pentagon to take another look at its fitness standards, especially how it measures body fat on service members. Right now, the military looks at height and weight, and in some cases, they do a tape test, taking measurements of the waist and neck. Women get their hips measured, too. Doctors say the Pentagon is using outdated tables, and some plastic surgeons say they get panic calls from military personnel looking for liposuction before a tape test. The test can determine a person's future prospects in the military. Failing three times can be grounds for discharge. The Air Force has already modified its fitness program. The American Academy of Pediatrics is marking, or rather making, a new recommendation likely to get a LOL or laugh out loud from youngsters. Limit their tweeting, limit their texting, and keep smartphones, TVs, and laptops out of their bedrooms. The AAP says screen time should be limited to no more than two hours daily. The doctors say many parents are clueless about the consequences of unrestricted media use, including obesity, violence, and cyberbullying. Well, some new research shows efforts to get teenagers talking about cyberbullying may be making a difference. We get the story from Maggie Mazzaretti of the Associated Press. Sarah Ball was only 15 when someone she considered her best friend posted on Facebook that she hated her. As the attacks got worse, Ball began cutting herself and contemplated suicide. When you're bullied online, like you're not, you could move away, but as soon as you turn on the computer, it's still going to be there. She eventually spoke out and found her voice creating the Unbreakable Movement, an outreach program that has gotten the attention of lawmakers in Florida. And more young adults like Ball are opening up about cyberbullying, according to a new poll by AP, NORC, and MTV. 44% reported seeking help from their family, up 9% from 2011. 66% of those who did say it made the situation better. Youth previously were a lot more hesitant to talk to adults because they were afraid that those adults would take away the technology or they would be labeled the tattletale or the situation would get so much worse. For Michael Vaccaro, being able to tell his mom after finding a derogatory online profile using his name and picture prevented a bad situation from getting worse. I do believe that it could have been really harmful, but at Thankfully, fortunately, it wasn't. Tragic cases like that of 12-year-old Rebecca Sedwick are also putting the spotlight on cyberbullying and pressure on parents to monitor their children's online behavior. Sedwick jumped to her death last month in Florida after authorities say she was bullied for a year and a half by two other students who've been arrested. Although online bullying is still a major problem, the poll showed a nearly 10% drop in the number of teens and adults who think online abuse should be accepted as a part of life. Maggie Mazzetti, The Associated Press. The decision to quit smoking isn't as unpredictable as one might think. San Diego state researchers say more smokers start trying to kick the habit on a Monday than any other day of the week. The study's lead researcher says he doesn't know why Monday is so popular, but he says anti-smoking programs would reach a larger audience by focusing on Mondays. While the government works to fix bugs and glitches on the Federal Health Insurance Exchange, enrollment on Covered California is relatively smooth, but folks still have lots of questions about health care reform. Joining us with her second opinion Q&A is Speak City Heights reporter Megan Burks. Megan, tonight's question comes from someone shopping California's exchange, right? Right. Shelly is an artist and works from home. Because she's self-employed, she never really knows exactly how much money she'll make by the end of the year. She wants to know what people with variable income should expect if they get a subsidized health plan on Covered California, only to find out later they made too much to qualify. Here's Shelly's question. Does the IRS base your qualification for subsidized premiums on last year's income so everybody knows whether you qualified or not or is it a maybe rude surprise at the end of this year to find out you didn't qualify when you thought you did 
So she's talking about the discounted premium some people will get on the exchange. Remind us who qualifies. So individuals making up to about $45,000 a year and families making up to about $92,000. So what income do you use to see if you qualify? Well, eventually you're going to use your adjusted gross income from your taxes this year. The exchange is basing it on your prospective income because it didn't want to shut out folks who hadn't filed taxes before. And Megan, what happens if you earn more money than you thought? So everything will be reconciled when you file taxes in 2015. If you make more than you told the exchange, you'll have to pay the government back for the subsidies you claimed. They'll either take it out of your tax return or you'll have to cut them a check. And on the flip side, what if you make less? The government will cut you a check. To ask your Affordable Care Act question and to see all of my Q&As, go to kpbs.org slash second opinion. Speak City Heights reporter Megan Burks. Today, Medicare announced what seniors can expect to pay next year for Part B coverage. The premium most pay for outpatient care will stay the same, just about $105 a month. The deductible for outpatient coverage is also staying the same, but there will be a $32 increase in the deductible for hospital care. I'm Judy Woodruff on the next news hour. How New York is preparing for the next big hurricane a year after Superstorm Sandy hit the coast. That's Monday on the PBS News Hour. A San Diego pioneer is sequencing in sequencing the human genome, talks with Peggy Pico about his new idea to use synthetic DNA to create vaccines and other organisms. Biologist and entrepreneur Craig Venter is known for being one of the first scientists to sequence the human, human genome and for creating the first cell with synthetic DNA. Now in his new book, Life at the Speed of Light, From the Double Helix to the Dawn of Digital Life, Venter writes about creating vaccines and other organisms from synthetic genomes. Craig Venter is also founder and CEO of the Venter Institute and Synthetic Genomics, both here in San Diego. Welcome. Thank you very much. Um, Craig, you opened your book with the question, what is life? How does your research attempt to answer that question? Well, it's gone a long way since uh, Schrodinger first posed that question in 1944. And we tried to answer it now by saying that life, all life as we know on this planet, are DNA software-driven machines. In other words, the DNA, uh, explain that a little bit. So it's as like software, software in your computer. DNA is actually the software of life, and it codes for everything fundamental in our lives. All right. In your book, you also talk about this device you've made called the Digital Biological Converter. Yeah. Uh, describe this, this box for us. Well, what we've done is we've digitized the DNA information. The Digital Biological Converter goes the other way. We start with the ones and zeros in the computer rewrite chemically made DNA. So that's what this box does. Right now it's not a small box, it's about the size of your desk here, uh, but in the future it'll be made much smaller. Give us an example of what you could do as far as you make a digital copy of an organism and what you're trying to do with this. So right now we can, through the internet, through the digital information, we can download a protein such as insulin uh, we can make a, a bacteriophage that kills specific bacteria, uh, and we can even download simple cells that are self-replicating bacterial cells. In the future, uh, no telling what it will be used for, but we're trying to design it so you can send a vaccine through the Internet to stop a new flu pandemic before it gets going. Okay, let's let's <laughs> let's look at this a little closer. <laughs> a vaccine through the internet, yeah. so somebody would uh, essentially log on to their computer and, and be this, able to. And the digital biological converter would convert that digital information. It'll actually write the DNA uh, for uh, the flu virus that's used for the vaccine. Uh, even package it into a syringe in the future for you. So this is happening in real time now. Only there's only one of these, and it's at the Novartis facility in North Carolina. We can send them an email with a new sequence in it, uh, and they can start the process of making new vaccines. Well, the title of your book, Life at the Speed of Light, it refers to what digital biological converters might be able to tell us about life on other planets. Yeah. Tell us about that. Well, the notion is just taking it further is uh, there's been a problem with sample return from Mars because we have to get a rocket up there that's big enough to blast off and get back here. But we're testing an idea. If you just had a simple DNA sequencing machine there, 
we could send it back in as little as 4.3 minutes as a digital magnetic wave. The digital biological converter would convert it back into DNA and remake the Martian bacteria. Okay, so you're talking about bacteria here, but could this lead to more complex uh, developments of more complex organisms, let's say a human organ or an entire person? Well, when you start with the DNA, at the most you can start with was remaking a human at birth. So it's not like Star Trek, beam me up, Scotty. It's the notion of you can send the instructions for making something. Uh, and so we, we're pretty much limited to very simple life forms uh, that you can make that will solve something. They'll cure a disease, uh, create a bacteria for manufacturing something on Mars, perhaps. Perhaps uh, insulin? Uh, insulin, if we can do that now, we can download that mm -hmm. from the internet. Uh, so uh, as we start to colonize Mars and other places, it could be the number one way that we send things back and forth. Well, this sort of leads into the next question. Critics of your work raise ethical concerns. I'm sure you've heard. Some say that you're playing God by uh, creating life out of something synthetic. Mm -hmm. What's your response? So we were the first ones to raise ethical questions and ask for review before we did our first experiments. And there's probably not been an area of science that's been more reviewed, more studied, uh, including in 2010 when we made our announcement, President Obama asked his new bioethics commission to take this on as their number one charge. So it's getting lots of public discussion, lots of review. Uh, every DNA synthesis company screens things to make sure that not getting requests to make something harmful. Uh, and when every major religion was asked about this work, uh, they view it as humans' responsibility to, in fact, as they say, play God, to try and come up with new benefits for humanity. Well, there's a whole lot more on our website about this and in your book, Scientist and Author of The Life at the Speed of Light. Craig Venter, thank you very much. Nice to be with you. Thank you. Well, we finally got a little wet stuff around here. Looks like one more day of possibility of rain and uh, showers in the county tomorrow. Showers along the coast with uh, a mix of sun and clouds later in the week. Temperatures uh, in the 60s and 70s. Similar weather for the inland valleys. Temperatures uh, in the 70s by Thursday. Mountain areas will see rain tomorrow as well. Temperatures dipping into the 40s. Sunshine in the daytime. Uh, sun, clouds in the desert tomorrow with temperatures there mostly in the 70s this week. Scientists are still digging for Ice Age fossils in the heart of Los Angeles after a century of discovery. So much has been uncovered from the La Brea tar pits that crews have a backlog of bones to clean and sort through. Rachel Marie Dillon of the Associated Press shows us what they've been finding. For a hundred years, the La Brea tar pits have been bubbling up fossils of extinct animals that once roamed Los Angeles. The saber-toothed cats, the dire wolves, the giant jaguars, and the short-faced bears. And providing clues about what California looked like during the last ice age. Right in the middle of the city, asphalt oozes in a public park. A lake of tar and rainwater belches methane bubbles, and paleontologists patiently dig. It really is is sticky, and this this is how the animal got got trapped in the first place. <clears throat> While the scientists of a century ago prized massive mammoth bones, today's paleontologists are searching for smaller treasures. The mice, the freshwater snails, the insects, the small birds, and you can go study and find out where they live now and be able to predict where they were living then and what it was like around here then. From the pits to the fishbowl lab, it's time-consuming work whether chiseling away at a prehistoric bison or slugging away at the tar around the same sloth fossil for almost a year. Found the very first freshwater limpet, and that's a tiny, it was two millimeters long and a millimeter wide. Volunteer Dixie Swift hopes that the tiny snail she picked out of the tar will provide climatologists with some insight into how these animals coped with dramatic global climate change brought by the end of the Ice Age. And with a backlog of a million fossils still waiting to be scrubbed, volunteers and scientists have enough to keep busy for another hundred years. Raquel Maria Dillon, The Associated Press, Los Angeles. Let's recap some of our top stories now. A new report says methamphetamine use is rebounding in San Diego County at its highest level in seven years. The Sandag report says police are finding more suspects testing positive for meth. 
and the number of people dying from meth use jumped by 16 percent in just one year. Former San Diegan Sarah Cruzan is expected to be released from prison this week after spending half her life behind bars for killing her pimp. She says he had abused her for years and forced her into prostitution. A jury convicted her of murder in 1995 and sentenced her to life in prison without hearing about the effects the mistreatment caused. An outpouring of community support has given new life to a longtime nature center in Chula Vista. Living Coast Discovery Center was in danger of closing this month if it didn't raise $200,000. They put out an SOS or Save Our Sea Life message and got an overwhelming response, more than $400,000 raised. Not only does it keep the center open, it gives them a reserve so they can develop a new business plan. The community saw the business people wanted to support the center, the school districts wanted to support the center, and then the money came rolling in. The center is home to hundreds of native animals and plants. They've been educating the public about coastal species for 26 years. And the Pentagon is taking some heat for its tape test, a way of measuring a service person's body mass. Critics say the test is based on outdated charts. They say its standards are driving some personnel to get liposuction just to pass. The physical test can determine a person's future in the military or whether they will be discharged. You can find tonight's stories and download the KPBS app all on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Good night.